Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on uh, writing microservices, so using Ballerina. Um, this session will contain uh, these topics, so starting with um, the, the, the special features we have in the language from network abstractions, network type system, concurrency, resiliency, security, and how would we do test-driven development, observability, and finally, how to do a cloud-native deployment. So these are the areas I'll be covering. And I'll um, end it up with a quick demo also. So I'll be doing some live coding here. And let's see whether it works out. <clears throat> so um, let's talk about the network abstractions we have in Barina. Um, so Barina is unique in a way uh, compared to other general purpose languages where we have focused on um, integrating the network aspects to the language itself. So um, in the earlier days, the languages they didn't like uh, think about network communication and these other things uh, uh, like firsthand. That's like an afterthought that they will come out with a library or something like that. But what's unique about Ballerina is um, so um, we have. Uh, uh, got the network concepts into the language itself. So because we know, like, uh, nowadays when we write programs, it always almost uh, involves right, doing some network communication, like talking to another service, getting something done uh, by calling another microservice, and so on. So we, we felt that it, it's, it's important to have these features out of the box and as first-class citizens of the language. So this is why uh, we have things like, so as you can see, uh, endpoints and services as concepts in the language. So if you can see this diagram, this is uh, a simple scenario of doing a, 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 a flight reservation. Uh, so this is a sequence diagram on what we are going to do in that scenario. So we have a caller, and we do a, a call to a specific endpoint. So we uh, call it the, we have the Air Croatia endpoint here. So uh, we are going to do a network call to that, and we are going to get a response out of that. So let's see how that is done in Ballerina. So you can see here, uh, this is the, the skeleton of the Ballerina program. And you start with an, um, with an endpoint. So, so there are two kinds of endpoints, uh, listener endpoints and client endpoints. So listener endpoints are the things, the the, it's a place where you get input into the uh, service. So, uh, so that's where you listen. So then the other type of uh, endpoint is the client endpoint. So this is where you send something out of the service, out of the system to an ex external, uh, external place. And, uh, and all of these are used in a service. So uh, we again have a, like a first class a uh, concept called a service in the language. So there you can use the server and the client endpoints. So uh, let's look at how uh, uh, a listener endpoint is defined. So you can see here the properties uh, that makes up the listener endpoint can be given inside that block. And you can also have the option to uh, give additional filters. So here you can see we have a logger filter, a token validator, and so on. So you can extend the uh, the incoming endpoints functionally using these filters. And uh, also, this, uh, this is the client endpoint. It's basically of type HTTP. Um, so it's basically used to do the sending out of the request to this specific HTTP endpoint. So you have properties like the URL and other uh, properties like should I follow redirects or not, and so on. So all of those are built into the uh, the endpoint properties. <clears throat> and this is, uh, these are the resources you find in a service. So those are the things that make up the service, like what are the operations and the resources that uh, consist uh, that makes up the service. So basically have the, you have parameters uh, saying uh, the caller endpoint, the request, and so on. So the caller endpoint is the source that you got the request from. So you can use that to uh, do operations like sending a response back, getting properties, and so on. 
so this the uh, uh, content of that resource, so the book flight. Uh, let's go through like what we are actually uh, doing in that uh, the resource definition. So using that request um, uh, object, we can get things like the request payload, uh, its headers, and so on. So we have like few helper, like convenience operations like get JSON payload and so on, which will which will get the payload as a JSON uh, value. So you can also get the binary value as well and then convert it to JSON. But we have some special convenience functions to get the, like the popular uh, data formats as well. So um, then after we got the, the payload from the request, then the next step is to send that payload to an external endpoint. So that's what we do with the, 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 the client endpoint you see here, Air Croatia. We do a post action to that, to this specific um, uh, path uh, by giving the, give, uh, giving the earlier payload. So you will see here, uh, we have used this uh, arrow notation here, which, uh, which says that's an action. So we make the distinction between function calls and action calls in uh, Ballerina. So an action call is basically when you do something over the network. Uh, to, to, uh, uh, to basically symbolize that special operation, we have a special syntax for it. So we clearly know, okay, you are actually doing something that goes out of the network. So, it's, uh, so post, operation, uh, post action is uh, one of those uh, actions. Then after that, uh, from the client respond, response, you can get the JSON payload again, if it's a JSON payload. And then what we are going to do is we get that response. We will uh, set that to our, as our uh, services response and send it back. So for that, what we do is we create a response object like that, set the payload, and we do a, a respond action to the caller endpoint. So this is something uh, a bit special. So uh, here we are explicitly saying uh, respond with this payload. Uh, so it's not like you are, it's not a return value of the resource or anything like that, but we are explicitly saying uh, to return this response. So this is uh, especially useful uh, when you want to handle the response errors, so any error condition you get while responding at the same place. So the, 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 the caller doesn't get any like very generic error message or anything, but you from the service itself, you can handle that and do anything uh, that is required at that point. So uh, the underscore here means we are basically ignoring the return value at that point, but it actually creates uh, returns a status of what happened uh, with the respond. So you can do uh, any error handling and so on with that call. <clears throat> So yeah, so at the end, this is what we basically implemented. Um, in Barina, if you visualize that code in our VS Code IDE uh, or any, anywhere like that, you will actually get this uh, representation uh, uh, like visually. So let's look at the available service endpoints we have. Uh, so we have inbuilt support for HTTP, HTTPS, HTTP2, uh, and other RPG protocol like uh, gRPC, then WebSocket, and also support for other the message brokers as well. And also we have uh, more support for other web-based APIs like uh, Twitter, Salesforce, and so on. We have a, a, a big collection of those uh, connectors as well. So if you go to our uh, connector repository, so you will be able to see a list of supported client uh, connectors we already have. So now uh, let's look at the network aware type system that we have in Ballerina, uh, starting from uh, JSON. So JSON is very often used nowadays. So uh, uh, JSON uh, type is inbuilt into the language. So it's sort of a special type where um, 
the JSON type is created as a special union type of the, all the other uh, the, the basic types we have. So it's basically, as it says, JSON is union type of the numbers, Boolean values, uh, the, the, the null or nil value strings, uh, and again, JSON values, so, which is an object and arrays. So it's a combination of this uh, which makes up JSON type itself. So you will learn more about how unions work uh, in, in, in later slides. And uh, so for the syntax, we have a very simple syntax. So this is similar to uh, JavaScript. Uh, you can define inline values uh, and access the fields with dot operator and so on. Also, we have a special functionality which you can do uh, uh, conver conversions between types. For example, from JSON to uh, a record conversion can be done with this syntax, with the angle brackets. So if you have a similar, if you have a specific structure as a record type, and if it's compatible, uh, we can directly convert from a JSON value to that record type. So when a conversion happens, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be a successful conversion, or, or it can be an error if it's not compatible for the conversion. So then what you will actually return is that type or error. So that means a union type, basically. So what this check does is um, it will remove the error from there. So if there's an error that, if, if an error happens at that point, it will either return an error from that function or it will throw an error. So you will see some examples of that later. <clears throat> so, um, so you saw earlier how you got the uh, JSON payload also from the request. Again, we use the same pattern. Uh, to check and get the value. So you do that if you are very sure that you are getting a JSON value, or you will basically get the union type and check whether there's an error or not. <clears throat> so some more examples on how to create JSON objects and how to set values, and also how, how you would uh, create a new HTTP response object using the new operator. And, like basically set the payload uh, using that. So you will also notice that it's set payload. It's not JSON payload. So we have a set payload function, uh, which will get, a, uh, again, a union type. So, uh, and that union type includes JSON as well. So that's why the JSON value also works there. <clears throat> so in the same way, uh, we support uh, XML as well. So XML. Um, we have a, a unique representation where we have XML items, a sequence of XML items, so it's easier to work with and uh, define. So again, you can define the uh, inline values like this, and also you can access uh, its members, the member elements, and so on with syntaxes like that, the, the star operator, and other special functions we have. For example, the at says basically get the attribute of this XML uh, item and assign it to uh, a variable. In the same way, if you just put at, it'll uh, return all the, uh, all the attributes as a key value map. Uh, so you can use that. <clears throat> so more examples of how the XML access work. So you can see here the select operation and so on can be used to filter elements that are there in the XML elements. Um, and so on. So you can write uh, queries like that to access specific uh, values in the XML items. <clears throat> so in the same way, as I mentioned earlier, so even an XML payload, you can again put, say, set payload and set the XML payload as well. So XML is part of the union type they accept, uh, uh, expect for that uh, function. So uh, now we actually come to union types, so, so to say exactly what a union type is. Uh, so a union type is basically uh, 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 a specific um, a new type constructor which has uh, multiple type. It can contain multiple types, basically, uh, in that variable. So it's somewhat similar to uh, in C, you had union types. So this is a more type-safe mechanism of representing unions, basically. 
Um, so uh, as you see in this example, this function returns a specific value, but you don't actually know whether it's an int or string. So we assign that uh, value to a union of int and string uh, of, uh, with the name variable uh, value. So, so in the runtime, it can uh, either be so, so multiple values like this. So another example is when you do a post operation, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't put the check uh, operator, uh, you will get either the response or an error. So uh, likewise. So now uh, the, 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 the next obvious question would be, how would you actually get the HTTP response, or how would you actually get the, uh, the value we want? So that is done with uh, the match expression. So uh, in the match expression, what we do is uh, we basically look at the value and check what the type is. So using the type, uh, it's like similar to a, a switch case in Java or any other language. So here we are switching, uh, switching the type of that variable. So here we say if it's an int, do this action. If it's a string, do something else, likewise. And um, uh, we also have another shortcut for this, with, uh, which calls a but expression. Uh, so you can say get something, uh, some uh, union value, but uh, if it's an int value, do something, and so on. So to the left-hand side, this expression will contain what's there in the, uh, those sub-expressions. So uh, int i uh, arrow, it returns string. So the left-hand side, it will be uh, uh, a string value that comes out of the full expression. <clears throat> so uh, more examples of that with the, the, the HTTP post, uh, the response values. So the general pattern we use is uh, if you get the response correctly, yes, you continue with the logic. Or if it's an error, you handle the error at that point. <clears throat> same with the same pattern with the uh, but expression. Uh, then we come to uh, error handling, so which is also uh, an important part when you are writing services and any general programs. Um, so uh, in in Barina, so we have a special error type, so which. Uh, which can be returned from functions or can be thrown out. So if you throw something, uh, either you have to catch it with a try-catch block, uh, or it will go up uh, to, the, uh, to the runtime. It will basically kill the process. So some general patterns are like this, uh, similar to what you'll find in other languages like Java. So you do something. If you throw something, like the errors, we saw earlier, like with the check and everything. So, if a, for example, if a check expression fails and if it uh, throws an error, you will be able to catch it from here. And uh, so, let's see a function which states that it's returning an error. So, it can be part of an union type also. So, if you say check, do something, that means the do, do something function can return and uh, an error also. So in the left-hand side, uh, so uh, obviously there's no error, so because we use the check expression. Uh, there, if you get an error, since we have said we are going to return uh, error from the functions, uh, function, uh, it'll return the error if, if uh, do something internal function uh, uh, throw, uh, returns an error. So at that point, it'll basically return the error from our outer uh, function, or else if our function doesn't say like we are returning an error, then yeah, then at this point, we, it will basically throw the error. So because the function doesn't say it's returning, so it doesn't have anything else to do, it will basically uh, ret uh, throw the error from this function. So that's how uh, the error handling works. Uh, let's do a, a quick overview of how concurrency constructs also work in Barina, so, which nowadays we often used in 
when we are building services and programs. Uh, in Ballerina, so we have a concept of a worker. So a worker is the, the, the smallest uh, uh, the construct we have uh, to do a parallel execution in Ballerina. So in, uh, in any function, you can have multiple workers. So uh, we, if you don't define a specific explicit worker, it will have a default single worker for that function, which gets invoked when you're calling the function. Or else, if you have multiple workers, those workers will execute parallelly when that function is called. Um, so the, the example you see here, when, this, uh, when the main function is called, you will, uh, these uh, statements will be executed simultaneously. <clears throat> so um, you can see here a, a practical example. So in our book flight uh, operation, it can be implemented like that. So let's say uh, the actual um, uh, uh, the network calls goes in a single work, and you are doing some additional logging uh, 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 functionality, logging operations in another work. So these will happen parallelly and they will execute independently and finish. So things like that can be easily uh, stated in Ballerina with the work functionality. <clears throat> and also, um, in workers, we have uh, a way to um, do inter-worker communication. So uh, this is done with uh, the send-receive operators we have. So we can basically say, uh, a specific variable and give a worker name and say send this value to this worker. Then when you do that, there should be a corresponding uh, receive operation also in the other side. So we actually uh, do a static check at compile time whether this is available uh, or else we fail it because all, all the time there should be a corresponding send and receive or you can have problems like deadlocks uh, and so on that can happen if you don't actually have matching send and receives. So we avoid that using some static analysis at compile time. <clears throat> and then we have uh, another asynchronous execution capabilities for normal function calls. So um, what, the, what that does is uh, any function call you call normally, you can say start the function call and it will um, execute separately, uh, synchronously. So you will basically return, you will get a future uh, object from this, which you can later check the state, whether it has finished execution, and if it has, what's the return value, and so on. So this is a very useful uh, construct when we want to do this type of uh, computation. So you can see uh, an example here, we do a log uh, log operation here, which we get the future, and later on we say await to that uh, future object, and we will get uh, the exact return type we got from uh, uh, the earlier function. <clears throat> also, we have uh, fork join uh, features, which which does the general fork join construct. We are in a function, you can fork the execution uh, to multiple workers, uh, do some work, then gather the uh, results you get from those uh, workers. So this is done with the join block, where you can say, uh, we can give like conditionally, you can say, wait for this many workers, or wait for a specific work to be done, or a specific number of workers. And the results, the the, 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 the accumulated results will be available in this map. So after that, you can do any logic that is required at this, at this place. So you can also uh, give uh, further properties like the timeouts for these uh, work executions and so on. So then uh, let's look at a bit on uh, the resilience features we have in Barina which is, again, critical for like microservices development. Um, so let's get a simple scenario where we have some uh, service communication from our microservice to some outside services. And so we have this service called hello, 
and Hello Calls, Simpson Quotes, and Twitter. And so the Simpson Quotes service, so let's say it's a bit uh, unstable. It's, it doesn't like work always, so the, the, the request may fail time to time. So what should we do at that point? So uh, one of the ways to handle that is using a circuit breaker pattern. So when the requests continue to fail, we basically block that and do our own logic in our thing until it heals. So patterns like that can be done to uh, rectify these uh, issues. Um, so let's look at some of the inbuilt features we have. So we have these timeouts, retry, failover, load balancing, circuit breaker, and so on. And also have, we have a extensive uh, transaction support also in the language uh, that is inbuilt, uh, which can also handle these failure situations, retries, and so on. <clears throat> then let's, let's look at uh, the security features we have. Uh, again, a critical uh, uh, component when we are doing communication. Um, so in Barina, we have a concept of being uh, secure by default. So that means all the actions we do uh, at, um, at any given point to best of our ability, we make it uh, as secure as possible. So if there are obvious things that should be secure, we make it secure. So for example, the XML ex external entity injection attacks and so on. So uh, to avoid that, we disable that feature by default. So if someone wants to have it explicitly, that's a different thing they have to do. But by default, it's not enabled. So likewise. And other built-in features like uh, OCSP CRL validation for SSL. Uh, and also, we have a, 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 a config API for reading secure data. Like when you have passwords and any other secret information, we have an API for that, which you can easily use from uh, configuration files. And uh, then we have another unique feature in the language called Tate Analysis, which I'll get into in more detail later. Uh, and also authentication and authorization uh, framework for services, um, which have multi like which is a pluggable framework uh, for having multiple authentication mechanism, user stores, and so on. So uh, let's look at the taint analysis we have. Um, so what it does is, um, in the code, when you have uh, any untrusted values, so these variables or values are marked as tainted. And when uh, in specific libraries or functions, you can say, uh, my uh, parameters are sensitive. That means if you are passing me some values, they better be untainted. So uh, that means tainted values can't be passed to those. So this is a full like compile time processing we do. So in our libraries, we mark all these functions and so on uh, by doing, uh, like we are deriving all the signatures and the information and marking, mark them as uh, like these variables and so on must be, uh, will be sensitive, and uh, they, they, they have to be handled in a, sp a certain way. So for example, uh, there's an, uh, the sample code here, um, which have a select function. So it says the SQL query is sensitive. That means any uh, tainted values can't be passed into the SQL query itself. So one of the tainted values are, for example, are uh, data you get from the network, like uh, a payload you get from a service, or user input, and so on. So things like that cannot be uh, passed to the SQL query uh, uh, without explicitly untainting it. That means you have to knowingly clean the data and pass into these uh, values. So because of that, uh, uh, things like SQL injection attacks cannot be done because you are knowingly passing the values uh, and cleaning it. Uh, so that scenario is covered like that. So in that way, there are a lot of scenarios um, uh, that, uh, that works in this uh, pattern. So you will see here how the SQL injection prevention happens. Um, 
So in the, as an example from the request, you will get some query params. And uh, what we are going to do is, in the, in the left side, um, we are going to pass that value uh, to the query uh, itself, like concatenating that string. We are going to use that value. But when you concat that value with the string, the whole string becomes tainted, because the params value itself is tainted, the params or ID is tainted, then the whole SQL query becomes tainted. So when that happens, um, at compile time, it says a tainted value is passed into the sensitive parameter SQL query. So it will fail at compile time. So uh, how we would fix it is, um, in the general pattern we do, uh, you don't pass anything to the SQL query itself, but you pass them as separate parameters. So it's like the, uh, the common name parameters uh, you have in other languages and so on. So when you pass it as separate variables, it's a, it's a safe way to uh, do the processing. <clears throat> so um, also, let's look at the inbound authentication and authorization uh, features we have. As I mentioned, we have a framework for that in Ballerina, so which, where you can plug in your own authentication handlers and user store implementations. So we have. Um, Handlers for like basic or JWT certificates, auth, and so on, and uh, user store support for like reading uh, user information from plain text files to LDAP, AD databases, and so on. So all these are supported when you want to do uh, any authentication authorization operation. Uh, then let's look at another. Uh, feature that's of used nowadays, observability. So in uh, your server uh, services, it's always better to uh, have good observability support to see what's happening in your services, what's happening in the runtime, if it's working properly, and so on. So here also, uh, in, the, in the runtime, in the language itself, we have several constructs that are observable defa default. So like the services, the client connectors, and everything, they are observable, observable by default. So they uh, emit the observability, like the, the, the events, uh, if you basically turn, turn them on globally. So uh, for example, from SQL connectors, HTTP operations, and so on, everything, is, uh, everything supports these features. So if you turn it on and uh, point to, a, uh, for example, a Prometheus server, it will start emitting the events, and you will, get a, uh, you will get all the events and the data you wanted. And also, uh, there's a user-level API also available if you want to enrich this with your own uh, data as well. Um, so as I mentioned, for, uh, if you look at the different categories we have, the tools and technologies we support are for matrix collection. We support Prometheus, Honeycomb, um, and for tracing, we support any open tracing vendor, like Jaeger, Sipkin, and so on. Um, logging, of course, you can use any logging uh, uh, framework which can read from log files, like ELK. And uh, visualization, we have some default dashboards we have, uh, which we have created for Grafana, so which you can interface with Prometheus and uh, see the visualization. So these are some of the dashboards we have. Uh, which you can see, like these for like a HTTP monitoring use case, and also this the uh, distributed tracing uh, case where we have used an open tracing provider to do some tracing through services, logging uh, through a ELK here. Yeah, and uh, let's look at how we would uh, do test-driven development in uh, when you are use uh, like developing microservices. So here I have uh, took a reference uh, architecture using the, the, the pyramid model. So again, if you are um, familiar with the pyramid model, so the idea is you write most of the, you starting from uh, unit tests, integration tests, components, and so on. You start from the smallest item, and you have to do the most coverage there. So you will be writing most of the tests for the smallest thing. So starting from a unit test, you will be covering uh, most of the functionality there. And going up, like integration, 
uh, you will be basically checking the integration between these uh, lower level units. So when you are doing the integration testing, you don't have to test all the permutations again, because that's been covered underneath. So you will but rather be testing the integrations. So this pattern goes up like this. So going from integration to components, like in, uh, in Barina, it will be packages. And then uh, finally to the deployment, So which, which can end up with your final binary or like a Docker container, Kubernetes deployment, and so on. So I have listed here like the possible approaches you can uh, use to uh, do each of these steps, like starting from unit test. Uh, we can use the Barina unit test functionality we have. So we have a test framework in Barina uh, uh, runtime itself, where you can run the uh, you can write the Barina test and run them in the build state. Um, also from that, then we move into the integration level, which you can do again with Barina service test. We have the feature. We have the features to uh, start and stop services, and so on. So you can uh, do service level tests as well. Again, the same thing uh, with component test. Component test means basically integrating with multiple services and so on, like aggregations, and so on. Uh, that will also be done with Barina service level tests. Uh, then the deployment level, so if you are having Docker, uh, Kubernetes deployments, and so on, you can use other external tools like the Google Container uh, Structure Test, uh, Falco for Kubernetes, and so on. So those can be used when it comes to the deployment. Uh, then we uh, go into the final part of the deployment angle. Uh, so the cloud native deployment, so there are so for Ballerina, there are multiple deployment options, starting from the standalone binary. Um, then we have uh, like built-in support for Docker and Kubernetes. So by just uh, putting some simple annotations in the code, um, you can generate the Docker and the Kubernetes artifacts there itself. And this will not require any code changes, but rather just the, if the uh, annotations are there, um, all the artifacts will be automatically created. So with that, you can deploy your uh, services to any supported uh, platform like AWS, Azure, and so on, uh, So which has a lot of services that has Kubernetes support. Um, so with this, you have a wide range of deployment possibilities with Ballerina. So um, let me go through a quick demo, which will show you some of the features, and I'll, I'll show a deployment part also. Um, yeah, let me go quickly through the code. So, um, let me see. I'll be writing a simple uh, service which do a GeoIP lookup. Uh, okay, let me increase the font size here. Better? Okay, great. So I'll be creating a simple service which will do a GeoIP lookup from um, a bunch of online services that are there. So I'll be using multiple uh, possible services uh, which can switch between uh, uh, the service has given a specific header. So uh, let's see how that is done. Mm. Uh, we'll be using the HTTP package. And I'll be creating the uh, listener endpoint. Oh, I will run it in 8080. This is the first endpoint I'll be using. Second service, uh, IP stack. So I now have the endpoints uh, listed here, the service endpoint. 
where I'll be getting requests, the two client endpoints. Now I'll be doing the service. And you see here it's a default, uh, uh, it binds default to an inline endpoint, but I have already created the endpoint, so I'll be using that. And this is the resource I'll be using. And uh, I'm annotating the uh, resource to say the path of that is root. And I'm expecting a value called IP as a path parameter. Also, my service will be deployed in root. And uh, let's go into the implementation. So first thing I'll be having is I'm saying which service type I'm going to use. I'm saying default is IP stack. <coughs> then uh, I'll be checking the header value uh, to s uh, sorry, it's request has header, I'm checking this header to see if the user has, has said that. If so, yes. Then creating a new response for the, the, the remote response I'll be getting after I call the clients. So if the service type is IP stack, I'll be calling stack get uh, IP stack <coughs> API it's yeah. So I untainted the IP because it's a uh, value that's getting from out outside, and the get variable is a sensitive parameter, so I untainted it explicitly and use it. And I have to say check here, it's because it returns response or error. And uh, I do the same for <coughs> the API. So now I have the remote response in hand. Now it's a matter of sending it out by getting the JSON response and putting it to the new response. So I'll create a new response. So actually this would be, so I'd untaint it and also check to remove the error here. So I have the new response, now I have to send it out. Respond. So I'm ignoring the return value here. So that's it um, for the service. Ideally it should work. Let's see. Yeah, let me get another window to do a curl command. I'll put the IP 8888, should be a Google IP. Oh, I think I got a wrong response. Let me check that quickly. Sorry? 35. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa.
Yeah. So you can see you got the response from that. Um, so let me put another header there to switch to another uh, provider. IP API is not happy. It's oh, it's not PHP. Sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, cool. So you can see that we switched to the other one. So in that way, um, so that's the service. Let me quickly show you okay, uh, how to deploy it quickly in uh, Kubernetes as well. So I have... Um, so I have configured a coop, uh, my coop control to point to uh, Azure AKS. So I'll quickly show you how that works. So it's a matter of putting some annotations. So service, I put a service annotation to the endpoint, in, inbound endpoint we have. So there I say service type, I'm going to say a load balancer. And port 80, so I'm going to expose through port 80. Um, then to the service, I'm going to do a deployment annotation. I'm going to say, push the Docker image I'm going to build, and username and password I will read from environment variables. Yeah, so basically what it does is, I'm giving the Docker Hub uh, username and password here. Uh, so what it, is, uh, what it does is, when I'm building this, it'll build the Docker image and push it to the uh, Docker Hub registry, and that'll be used by uh, AKS when it's, building, uh, when it's using it in uh, Kubernetes. So I'm guessing that's it. I'm going to set my username and password here. Okay, I set my environment variables. Um, okay, uh, another thing is you have to give the image name. Say your service. Okay, let's do a banana build. So here it's creating the Docker image and um, it should upload the Docker image. Good. So that's done, and you can see you will get the doc uh, kube control command you have to type here, which I will use. You can see here the deployment and the service is created. Let's quickly list the pods. And you can see here the pod is running. Let's list the services. You can see here the GRP, this service is uh, registered as type load balance and the external IP is pending. So, in a while, it will update with an actual IP address, which we can use uh, to access the service through the internet. Um, it should come soon. 
<coughs> yeah. So this is the external IP. Let me use it here. So I gave port 80, so I'll just have to give the IP. So you can see here the response came, so it was still uh, executing earlier. This one. So yeah, it's the same JSON you got earlier. So now, so you can see how we got the same service deployed in uh, Azure Kubernetes service, and we were able to quickly get a public IP and access access service here. So that's it uh, for my presentation. Uh, thank you. If you. Yeah.